He's conforming us to the beautiful image of Jesus Christ. He's making us beautiful reflections of himself. He's making us fit for the kingdom instead of Gehenna. That's what salvation is all about, folks. That's salvation from a biblical perspective. To focus exclusively on a legal transaction that cancels Gehenna completely misses the point. Certainly misses all the good stuff. That's like saying the point of going to high school is to find a legal loophole so you don't flunk your senior year. Really, is that the point of going to high school? No, the point of going to high school is to learn, to really learn, and to really become a certain kind of person that's ready to meet the world. That's the point. And if you do that, you know what? As a sort of footnote, you will uh, manage to not flunk uh, your senior year in high school. But to go into it saying, uh, the goal here is to find a loophole to not flunk your senior year in high school, what's going to happen is, if that's your goal, you're not going to learn the way you're supposed to learn. You're not going to grow the way you're supposed to grow, and high school won't be doing what high school is supposed to do. So it is with salvation, folks. The point of salvation is not to, get, to find a loophole, a way for trash to escape being thrown into Gehenna where trash belongs. The point is to grow out of our trash. The point is to become a person fit for the kingdom rather than Gehenna. The point is that God transforms trash into stuff, beautiful stuff, beautiful people, beautiful creatures who are reflect his character and are fit for the kingdom. And that is salvation. That is salvation. That's the biblical view of salvation. It's holistic. It's broad. It's beautiful. It encompasses everything. See, if you reframe things that way, if you re reframe things that way, it really, it really affects your whole theology on a lot of other things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to very briefly touch on five things that it, that it reframes. Uh, just so you know that when we talk about these things, here's what we mean, because there's a lot of talk out there that means something different. But, for example, number one, this is what it means to belong to the kingdom. We always talk about the kingdom because Jesus always talked about the kingdom. What it means to belong to the kingdom, it's not a legal fiction thing. It's not a pretend thing. God didn't find a way to cheat the system and now act like we're kingdom people even though we're not. The kingdom is about reality because God's always about reality. And the reality it's about is Becoming a domain over which God is king. That's what the word kingdom means. It's a real thing. It's not a pretend thing. God wants to reign over our life in fact, not just pretend, not just theoretically. And as God reigns over our life as king, and we learn to submit more and more to him, he takes the trash out of our life. So now our character comes to line up with our pledge of faith in him, and we're made into kingdom people. Secondly, this is what it means to have faith. This is what it means in a biblical context to have faith. Our culture, because of the courtroom analogy, tends to think faith is mere belief. I, I, I believe that that transaction happened. That is not the biblical concept of faith. The biblical concept of faith, like most concepts in the Bible, needs to be understood in a covenantal context, like a marriage context. And to have faith in a marriage context, a covenant context, is to trust, put your trust, that the other person will be a faithful covenant partner, but it's also a pledge that you will be a faithful covenant partner. You're having faith in the covenant. This covenant's going to work. Why? Because I trust you and you trust me. That's, that, that's faith in the covenant context. It's not mere belief. That'd be like saying getting married is a matter of believing that your wife exists. That's not quite a marriage. No, no it's, it's, it, it's, it's about having faith in the marriage and being faithful in the marriage. When you think, when you, when you, when you think kingdom, don't think courtroom, think marriage. When you think faith, when you think through the Bible, our relation with God, don't think courtroom, think marriage, covenant. That's why, from a biblical perspective, to have faith absolutely has consequences on your behavior. It can't help but have consequences on your behavior. That's why James says that faith without works is dead. It's dead. It's useless. Faith without works is mere belief. And even the demons believe. It doesn't do them a better good. Faith goes way beyond belief. Now, it's not that we're earning anything. This isn't about works. We're not impressing God. We're not earning anything. Okay, this isn't salvation by works. This is salvation by faith. But genuine faith has an implication on your behavior because you're entering into a covenant. Number three, have you ever noticed that the Bible talks about salvation quite different than many Americans do? The Bible talks about salvation in three tenses, past, present, and future. So Paul says, for example, in Ephesians 2, God made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Past tense. So you have been saved. When you surrendered your life to Christ, you were saved. Past tense. But it also talks about salvation in the present tense. Did you ever notice that? 
For example, 1 Corinthians 1. Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To those who are in the process of perishing, it's, it's foolishness, but to us who are in the process of being saved, that's an interesting thing. We Americans don't talk like that very much. We always say, are you saved? We don't say, are you in the process of being saved? The Bible does. Then the Bible also talks about salvation in the future tense. Uh, Romans chapter 5. For if while you were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Future tense. I have been saved. I'm being saved. I shall be saved. Now, the reason we don't talk that way very much in, in American Protestant circles especially is because we have a courtroom analogy that sort of governs our whole thinking about salvation. And the courtroom analogy, it makes no sense to talk that way. You either signed the deal or you didn't. It's a legal transaction. But see, if you think in terms of um, uh, uh, covenant, it makes perfect sense. I was married. I am being married. I shall be married. It's a relationship that occurs over time. Uh, I was saved when I first surrendered my life to Christ because now God says, okay, good. Now I got something to work with. I can plant my mustard seed kingdom in them. I can start taking the garbage out. But I'm also being saved because garbage is still being taken out. And I shall be saved because when all the garbage is taken out, then the light of truth will come on and it will be clear that I am, in fact, fit for the kingdom. God has made me fit for the kingdom. All three tenses apply. This is also true, and this brings me to point number four, of the term justification. Justification. We are, the word means declared righteous. We are declared righteous. Now, in the courtroom analogy, that de being declared righteous is sort of a, it's a legal thing. It, it, it applies legally, but it doesn't affect you really. You're not really righteous. You're just declared righteous. And so people think, well, th you know, th there's a split here. As long as God declares me righteous, he apparently has got bad eyesight so he can't see my sin. Good, good for me. I submit to you that that is just not the way the Bible talks and thinks and speaks about this reality of being justified. Look at God does declare us to be righteous, but God doesn't pretend he doesn't cheat at the game and he doesn't have bad eyesight. When God declares you righteous, it's because you're righteous. There's no pretending going on. Look at, think about it this way. When God talks, reality occurs. He creates. When God says, let there be light, there's light. When God says, let there be dry land, there's dry land. When God says, let there be righteousness, because a heart has yielded to him, there's righteousness. That's not a pretend thing. That's a real thing. Now, here's the thing. When God said, let there be light, there's automatically light, nothing but light, because there's nothing to resist the light. But when God said, let Greg Boyd be righteous, there's something that resists it. Fights back, pushes back. It's the old Greg Boyd. It's the trash Greg Boyd. And now my whole life is about Letting the truth of who I am, because of what God's doing in my life, has done, is doing, will do in my life, letting the truth of that push out the garbage, taking out the garbage, so that the reality of who God says I am and my actual character and thought process are in harmony with one another. There's no hypocrisy there. Our job is to yield to what God is doing to get, out, to get the trash out of our life so that we, in fact, are kingdom people. Paul puts it in, in terms of the old self, new self. For example, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, you were taught with regard to your former trash way of life, and here's my little paraphrase, your former trash way of life, to put off your old trash self. Take out the garbage, which is being corrupted by its deceitful trash desires. And you were taught to be made new in the attitude of your kingdom minds, be transformed by the renewing of your minds, know who you are in Christ, and to put on the new kingdom self, Created, it's already created, it was spoken into existence, to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Not a pretend righteousness and holiness, not God's bad eyesight righteousness and holiness, true righteousness and holiness. What Paul is saying is this, take out the trash, it's not who you really are. You have been justified, you are being justified, you shall be justified, so get rid of all the trash that disagrees with that because in fact you are a holy creature in Christ Jesus you are righteous in Christ Jesus you are a child of God in Christ Jesus and anything that doesn't agree with that is a bunch of trash take it out take it out get rid of that trash thinking process get rid of those trash emotions that trashy attitude that you got that trashy behavior that you that you have quit acting and thinking and feeling like trash and manifest your new self in Christ Jesus it's who you truly are not pre no, no pretending here God does see the trash he just knows 